Hi. Um, so I'm excited to be here today uh, to talk about uh, recent work around combating anti-Blackness in the AI community. I want to start off by focusing on why we are all here today. Um, we're here today due to the continuous extrajudicial killing of Black people uh, that has gone on for as long as living memory, right? Um, we can go back to the massacre of Appaloosas in 1868, um, which happens to be in the, uh, the hometown where my family is from, right? This, my, where my origin is from, um, all the way up until this century, uh, a few years ago, the Charleston church shooting. Um, there have been continuous uh, brutal, heinous acts of violence um, against Black people uh, occurring domestically, uh, as well as internationally and globally. Um, so within the last decade or so, there have been growing movements around injustice uh, on police br brutality, among a bunch of other things. So Black Lives Matter, Say Your Name, related movements uh, perhaps started around 2012, uh, but there you know, have been continuous things from Trevon Martin to Renisha McBride to Eric Gardner and Michael Brown to Mir Rice, uh, Laquan McDonald and Sandra Bland. Uh, there have, has been a continuous and growing recognition and focus on this problem within this current generation which all boiled over to a peak this summer, right? Uh, this is the Google search trends for police brutality. And we see around June this year, uh, spawned in part by the brutal killings of Breonna Taylor, uh, Ahmed Arbery and uh, George Floyd in rapid succession uh, caused an influx of interest and passion around addressing these problems and addressing them in an urgent manner. In 2020, we saw growing protest movements internationally. Uh, we saw elevated calls for action, such as defund the police, gain mainstream recognition. And we also saw <clears throat> a flood of corporate statements in support of Black Lives Matter um, from Nike, Twitter, Vox, um, really everywhere. And, you know, as big corporations, you know, continuously put out statements in support of Black Lives Matter, I think it's important to also look at their track record and, you know, their continuous actions um, and hold them to account uh, for the things that they're putting forth. So given all of this context, <clears throat> uh, insert myself, right? Who am I? Um, I'm not big on credentialing. Uh, so I'll try to be as brief as possible. Uh, one thing that I am is I'm an AI re researcher. I'm an AI researcher and I'm a member of this AI community. And the other thing is that I spend an inordinate amount of time uh, fighting against various forms of anti-Blackness. Uh, I am not unique in this. I'm not, you know, this is a trait that I share with a large number of Black people who try to exist in climates uh, which have a large amount of anti-Blackness. Um, and this is somewhat of a, a cost we pay for pursuing some of our academic passions. Uh, so with, with all of this context, uh, there's a, a question of, you know, what brought us here today, right? As, as these explo the explosion of awareness and acknowledgement of the depth and, the, the depth and seriousness of systemic anti-Blackness, you know, from seeing the corporate statements to protests to, you know, uh, municipal laws getting passed, more work on defunding the police. Uh, there was an influx of people who are asking, what can I do to help? Uh, people within my network, genuine friends, aware of some of the other work and activism that I'm a part of, were asking, what can I do to help? And that is an extremely uh, challenging question to answer. Even if I might consider you one of my closest friends, being able to tell you what you can do to help is hard and layered. And I guess I kind of want to step through a little bit of why that's such a hard question to answer. So if you ask me that question, given no context uh, and you know, pushing for the most effective things possible, I may tell you, you should quit your job. 
Uh, you should become a full-time volunteer for the NAACP Legal Defense Fund. And while you're at it, you should donate all of your wealth to organizations like the Community Justice, Justice Action Fund. These are steps that can be taken, which I truly believe a tremendous amount of people took them. We would affect change on a very large scale. However, I also suspect that no one will take me up on that call. And as such, it's not a useful statement to make. Uh, we, we don't get progress in that manner. Okay, so we ruled that one out. What else can I say in response? What can I do to help? Well, you could help me with whatever initiatives that I happen to be working on at the moment. Right, okay, you can help volunteer at the ACT tutoring session that I'm running uh, back in Louisiana next month. Uh, that would be something that would be useful, would be productive, but maybe it's not the best spending of your time. And really that's perhaps the majority of that, that help goes to me as opposed to best positioning yourself and all of your resources to make as much impact as possible. Another thing that could happen is we could sit down and we can have a really in-depth discussion around how much money, time, and personal influence you're willing to dedicate to this cause um, and which initiatives you believe in and are willing to support. And you know, we could work, on, work together on positioning you in a place to make the most impact as possible. This is extremely hands-on and it's something that doesn't scale. Uh, and as such, I'm limited in how many people I can have this type of relationship with. The fourth thing is I could say, read a book. Um, I think that misses the point a little bit on the action. Reading a book is useful and I do think books should be read. Uh, however, I suspect that there'll be a large drop off in the amount of people wanting to do something and those who will go through the work of reading multiple book books before they commit to what they're gonna do next. Um, so this way it gets to the problem statement. How do we best marshal a large influx of new people and resources aimed at combating anti-blackness within the AI community? So we get to my solution. I wrote a piece, apparently I submitted it in mid-June on combating anti-Blackness in the AI community. Um, perhaps it can be viewed as some form of a boot camp crash course on onboarding, um, where my goal is to provide as much background, explanation, and practical examples as possible uh, to help guide people so that they can positively contrib contribute to combating anti-Blackness within their respective communities. Um, all of this, all of this happened over the summer. This talk was scheduled, uh, you know, based on this. And before we get to February, some other things have happened within our community, which are very relevant to the topics which we're discussing. Um, so there was the public, there was the firing, Google's firing of Tim Gibru. Um, which spawned a tremendous amount of conversation, debate, um, animosity. It spawned a lot of, you know, reactions within our community. And it has a tremendous amount of implications, right? From, you know, ethics and censoring to um, massage noir to like all of these, you know, it's multi-layered, faceted and tiered, and we can talk about this at great depth. Um, However, I'm gonna to try to just focus on one part of that. Uh, we can have more in-depth discussion in the Q&A if that's the way we wanna go. Um, but one of the things and one of the public rebuttals or public statements addressing the causes of this you know, rapid and unceremonious termination uh, was an email which was sent in which uh, Tim uh, identified multiple mechanisms which enable uh, anti-Blackness to be pervasive within her organization. Um, and one of my takeaways from that response was that, you know, this act of calling out and addressing the mechanisms that enable anti-Blackness is unacceptable. And this was being said by, you know, some of the loudest, most prominent, respected, and powerful voices in our community. Uh, as a graduate student who essentially has been trying to do the same thing, call out where the mechanisms for addre addressing anti-Blackness uh, should be attacked and remedied, it's, it's chilling. And it definitely raises the stakes or nerves, whatever you want to call it, for me going forward and continuing with this talk. Um, but, you know, I'm committed to speaking truth or my truth um, and moving forward with that. So uh, I wanted to show, I did want to illustrate, right, like the depth of the conversation that this action had caused. Um, but while trying to do that, 
I found something that was like, I don't know, pretty troubling to me. Um, I really just wanted to look at what number of articles were generated by this. And it turns out that Google decided to suppress the news results on Timnit's name when searching, right? You could search any, you could, this was this morning, you can search anyone, uh, any name you want in the web, news will pop up in this thing, but except for Timnit, it seems to be uh, squashed. I think there's another whole set of ethical conversations that could go into <laughs> manipulating search results or whatever you want to call there. Uh, I am not set up to have that conversation in this talk since this is new, but I do think it's worthwhile to note. Um, so let's go on to what the approach that I'm going for. Um, so first, I'd like to present a lightweight framework for better understanding mechanisms that enable anti-Blackness. I would like to illuminate some of the myriad ways that anti-Blackness presents itself within our community. And then I'd like to discuss some of the ways to address them. So key most central point of this talk, if you take one thing away, is that anti-Black racism impacts every aspect of our society. I wanna pause and restate this. Uh, Anti-Black racism impacts every aspect of our society. I can't see your beautiful faces, but I presume there may be two forms of reactions to this. There may be some slight head nods and there may be some slight cringes, right? Like surely it can't be this bad. It can't be this pervasive. It can't impact everything, right? And perhaps you're rambling your head right now thinking of areas in which this isn't the case. Um, I challenge you to, I challenge you to, you know, whatever area you think you've identified, dig into it for 15, 20 minutes. And I would be surprised, maybe astounded even, uh, if you can't figure out how anti-Black racism permeates that segment of society as well. Um, so this is just a list of some of the areas that are impacted by anti-Black racism. Access to healthcare, access to clean water, public transit, the right to vote, public education, equitable raises, e equitable wages, air pollution, housing, criminal justice, financial services, food accessibility. Um, it is rampant, it is widespread, it is everywhere. Um, so let's get into some tools for better examining systems of, of racism. Um, as an AI researcher, I do have a predilection to really like digging into systems. Um, so hopefully this audience reflects some of these beliefs. Um, and we can dig into it now, but I break it down into three segments, three types of uh, mechanisms or systems that contribute to anti-Black racism. One are physical resources, the other are social resources, and the third are measures. I'll repeat it, I really don't like the name measures, but uh, hopefully I can define it well enough where we can it can be useful. Uh, physical resources. So Black people consistently have less access to physical resources. Well, the median net wealth of Black families is one tenth of that of white families. Healthcare, pregnancy related mortality weight, rate for black women is three times higher. Even water, race is the strongest predictor of water and sanitation access with uh, black and Latino uh, families being twice as likely uh, to not have indoor plumbing um, than white families. Uh, physical resources, we can get more specific into things more directly tied to technology access to quality computing resources, access to high speed, high quality internet, which becomes more and more important as we live in this virtual world, um, high school programming courses. There are a tremendous amount of areas where the story is the same. The area which I would like to stress the most is time, uh, mainly because I don't think it's, it is discussed often enough. Um, I will repeat this often because I think it is extremely important, um, but the burden of fixing these broken systems disproportionately falls on those who are already the most hurt by these existing systems. Uh, the time trying to navigate through and combat anti-Black racism contributes to anti-Black racism, right? This is time that is not spent on other things. Um, so I guess let's, let's dig into it, I guess, a little more, right? Like the time spent marching, right? Advocating for right to live, the right to live freely, uh, to be protected by those meant to protect us and stuff like that. These take time and the people, the majority of the people or people who are marching at a, a higher clip than other demographics will be black people. Um, the time spent advocating, the time spent advocating for necessary changes for, you know, obviously broken systems that need fixing. 
the this takes time time spent consoling right like when instances of severe racism happen right a lot of times we have to comfort we have to be that support for each other um this again is time spent dealing with anti-black racism um there's also like the time spent interrogating and second guessing was is this treatment was this based on you know is it just this person is he just rude or they do they just act in this way are they treating me this way because i'm black maybe i should confer with other black people and other people within the art to try to better understand how I'm, you know, if am I being treated fairly? Uh, why am I being treated in this manner? Um, other things are recruiting, right? You're one of the few black people in your organization. Whenever a new black person wants to join, it'll more likely fall upon you to talk to them, right? They, they have no way to get a sense of the climate uh, in regards to racism in these organizations with, without conversing with you. Um, and this becomes more and more time put on your plate. Uh, we could also talk about organizing, right? Whether that's organizing talks, organizing events, um, or even, you know, organizing sessions for relief and break. Uh, a lot of that work falls upon the same group. All of that time spent doing these things to combat uh, racism is time not spent reading, you know, the latest paper, which may be relevant to a project that you're doing, or writing, you know, the first draft of this paper, which you may be submitting next, next month, or submitting code, right, that's very close to being finished, but you have to clean it up, which, you know, at the end will determine your placement in the hierarchy of your organizations. There's also time not spent with loved, loved ones. Right, this is time that's being stolen from, you know, from your kids or your significant others or your parents who you may not have as much time with left. Um, there's also time not spent exercising and taking care of your health and body. All of these things contribute. Um, and I do think the theft of time may be the most egregious of some of these things that are taken away. Uh, next, we have social resources. So who we know and who knows us. Um, I you know, would argue that who knows us is perhaps more important because that's typically how you get access to opportunities, right? Not everything is posted publicly. You know, sometimes there's a, a bit of a reaching out networking behind the behind the scenes going on. Who know who knows you well enough to know what you're well suited for and what you're interested in um, is a big thing. Um, the other thing is what is the nature of these relationships, right? Like is there an element of trust? Is there hierarchy? Are you in a position where you have relationship, relationships with Black people where there's enough trust? They will call you out when you're doing something wrong. Um, that, you know, that may be a, a selfish reason to have these relationships, but that's something that definitely should be considered. Um, so why do I harp on social resources? So much of what actually happens in artificial intelligence is based on social connections. What job roles are filled? What projects are worked on? and what collaborations are formed. How are we compensated? Especially within AI where the compensation structure is so hidden, it's nearly impossible to tell if you're fairly compensated unless you have a relationship with someone who's already in one of these roles that has enough trust that they're comfortable sharing, you know, the details of their compensation package with you. Um, other things are like what social structures accept you as a member. Um, what is and isn't AI? That is still a source of contention um, in which boundaries get drawn in, you know, social, political manners. Uh, and it has ramifications, right? Like what department you would be in if you come in as a professor or, you know, what, where you are in an art chart in a research organization and things like that. Social resources have dramatic discrepancies, right? Um, so the average white person's social network, uh, you know, according to this definition is 1% black, right? With 75% of white people having all white social networks. Um, our social networks are remarkably stratified um, and they also play a very prominent role in our successes. And as such, you know, anything that you're doing to combat anti-blackness should definitely consider this. Uh, the last one is measures. Um, and I said, again, I'm not in love with the name, but by measures, what I mean is anything that is used to evaluate, punish, or reward individuals. Uh, this, you know, draws me into one of the aphorisms in, uh, in machine learning. All models are wrong, but some are useful. And I propose an, amended, an amendment that most are anti-Black. Um, so we started this conversation talking about some measures, right? Criminal justice is an area in which there's a tremendous number of measures 
all of which are skewed in anti-black ways, right? Drug arrests, hey, they, you know, people consume drugs at the same rate, but there's significant dis uh, distinction in who's arrested. Uh, sentencing, even people convicted of the same crime, how much time you get, there's uh, great disparities there. Use of force, uh, hopefully that one at least is obvious enough where we don't have to dig into it. And even what laws that we drew, we draw as criminal and what things are legal are all influenced um, by anti-Blackness in certain manners. Uh, other things, other areas in which these things present itself are resume screenings, right? Like, hey, there's the experiment where you change the name um, and the same resume gets treated drastically different. Uh, standardized testing, you know, home insurance, car insurance prices. A lot of times models, AI models or AI related models are used for conducting these. Um, and they, you know, mark black neighborhoods as more dangerous, less safe, more expensive. So now there's an added tax on top of everything else um, going on. The same thing with gunshot detectors, right? Like where are they located? What neighborhoods are they located in? Um, even things as benign as code reviews uh, have been shown to exhibit bias uh, in their evaluation in school suspensions uh, for our children growing up. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't start when we enter the professional world. Uh, so again, recapping, these are the three axes which I'm talking about, physical resources, social resources, and measures. These are not perfect categories and there's overlap, right? Credit could be viewed as a physical resource. It could also be viewed as a me measure, things like that. Um, but I do think, they're not perfect, but I do think it's useful in helping to dissect systems. Um, so now getting into the meat of the talk, addressing anti-Blackness in the AI community. So first and foremost, I wanted to talk about who benefits for diver from diversity efforts. Uh, perhaps underladen in that is why should diversity efforts exist? Um, I posit that the reason these efforts should exist is because per uh, perpetuating racism is bad and we should stop it. Uh, perhaps this is controversial, but this is my statement. Perpetuating racism is bad and we should stop it. So who should fix this? Right, I do think that we all should be invested in fixing this. Um, I don't think that this burden should fall on Black people to fix this. And you know, to be frank, I don't think Black people have the ability in and of themselves to fix this massive system which is being imposed upon them. So the high level approach, uh, I would argue for being effective in this space is to one, focus on enacting change in areas where you have power. Focus there first. You know, clean up your own house, put on your own mask, fix your area first, um, as well as support and engage with those already doing this work. Right, uh, a lot of a lot of the work towards this is logistics, right? And you don't you don't have to be a you know an expert in blackness um, to help find you know to help plan a banquet, right? To to help uh, with all the logistics that go around with a lot of these events that are designed to make Black people more important of this community. Um, and lastly, for any new initiatives or efforts that you're taking on, please consider closely and carefully how physical resources, social resources, and measures come into play in these processes and make sure that you're not amplifying anti-Black racism. So yeah, so this part wasn't in my paper. So let's start with the fun, let's start with the industry, right? Industry is an important component of the AI community. Right, a large amount of research is done there. And this is where you know, the rubber meets the road, right? A lot of these models, a lot of our approaches exist in the real world and are having real world impact um, in industry. So you know, when we talk about the community in these organizations, I, you know, I'd argue one of the first things that we should focus on is retention, right? How are, are black people staying in your organization? How are they staying? What are your rates of promotion? Are they similar? Are they are they identical? Like, are are black people thriving in your organization at the same rates of everyone else? Um, this is a, a question which I think is is seldom answered, and it's, you know, even more seldom publicly answered in any of the reports or anything that gets put forth. Um, how does your evaluation process work? Right, like, let's actually dig into it. Um, how does your process account for well-known biases in performance evaluations? Right, you know, this could be industry, this could be academia too. Um, a lot of these measures which we use uh, to evaluate performance have known biases and problems with them. Um, how do you account for that? Or do you just take it as is and move forward? 
uh, if so, you're probably your organization <laughs> probably is not looking as diverse, equitable, and inclusive as you hope it is. Is your promotion or evaluation process resilient to bad actors? Right? Like, you know, do you require unanimous consent to move someone up a level? Is it consensus? What happens if someone, you know, is antagonistic, right? You know, perhaps it's not publicly stated for the reason, but things outside of the merit and performance of the person contribute to them not getting put in positive uh, positions. Is your process, are your processes robust to handle that? Have they considered that in their design? If not, you know, perhaps you should dig a little bit deeper. Um, how does credit assignment work within your organization? I know uh, a lot of organizations kind of assume that, you know, credit will be assigned appropriately and everyone will move forward and stuff like that. But one of the things that, you know, black people in this space suffer from is a lack of benefit of the doubt, right? If there's any place for ambiguity, you know, they tend to get the short end of the stick. Um, so how do you, how do you address uh, credit assignment and benefit of doubt? How does that factor into your processes? Um, last, I, I talk on what is valued and what is dismissed, right? What is this diminished, right? Not every, you know, things aren't cut and dry. There's certain forms of work that are expected and that exist. Uh, which may not be valued as much, right? If, if one person spends more time onboarding people on the team, is that something that's gonna contribute to their success? Or is that something that's gonna actually hold them down? They should have just been focused on pushing out their code. Um, how do you think about all the contributions that your team members make? Um, and are they weighted appropriately and meaningfully? Uh, and we'll dig into this more when we talk about diversity and inclusion efforts. Uh, other things are high impact projects. Who gets assigned? what high impact or stretch projects, things that will help them grow, help them get noticed, help them make a bigger impact on the company. Um, who gets assigned these projects and how are they assigned, right? This is one of the areas where social resources tends to play a really big role. Uh, it's important to at least acknowledge that not all work is valued equally. And what you work on is, you know, often as important of how well of a job you do. And so I think in that sense, it's important to really interrogate how social networks come into play in project assignments. Uh, last is how diversity efforts are valued, right? Um, when I, if I've had several conversations around this, and I think a repeated refrain is that diversity efforts are valued in our process. And it's, it's really treated as a binary. And I would argue that is not how it should be done. Um, I think we need to be really precise on how we factor diversity efforts into the promotion process, into the evaluation process? Um, are they evaluated with the same depth and rigor in which you would do other engineer, in which you would do other critical aspects, right? Are we gonna, you know, are we just gonna say, oh, they did work in this space, that's good enough? Are we gonna dig deeply and figure out how much work they did? How impactful was it? How valuable was it? Um, are we asking for references on their DNI efforts, right? Um, how you know can can we apply better or more sufficient depth and rigor to our evaluation of the uh, diversity efforts and actually value them um in pushing forth uh a lot of times you know black people in organizations are forced to choose between you know doing this type of work which makes uh often hostile environments at least manageable or you know advancing on their career path. Uh, these trade-offs are real and they directly contribute to anti-Blackness in our community. Um, the other is like, what are the consequences of failed efforts in diversity uh, and inclusion, right? If, if a team continues to be, you know, overwhelmingly homogenous, are there punishments, right? Are, are, there, are there benefits and are there punishments? If, if a team continues to underdeliver on projects, things will happen. You know, there may be a reorg, people may be let go, things will change. What happens when they do this, when they fail on diversity efforts? Um, so, you know, let's, let's actually and meaningfully uh, define their value and live by and act on that. Um, there's more that could be said here. And, you know, if we go into the questions, um, we can open that up. Or can, and other things, you know, maybe a little less comfortable things to talk about is, what happens when things go wrong? Are, are the concerns of your black employees, your black coworkers and colleagues, 
Are they listened to? Are they acted upon? How are they acted upon? You know, the how, how if how you act upon it, you know, engenders more trust for them to continue to come forth, right? So that they can help to build a more inclusive community. Or is it is it sideswiped, right? Um, who is protected in your organization? So things things will go wrong, right? Any organization of considerable size and considerable time, there will be an incident, things will go wrong. Um, what does your organization do? Who is protected? Um, do you protect the reputation of the company, the most senior person in the organization? Or is the focus on protecting the injured party, protecting the most vulnerable party in these relationships? Another question that could be asked is, what is prioritized? Are we prioritizing the impact of actions that go unfavorably? Or are we prioritizing intentions? When we prioritize intentions, again, we know who gets the short end of that stick. Um, when we prioritize impact, that's a, a way of true accountability, right? We don't, we don't talk about what your intentions are with the code that you release, right? If your code brings down the site, it brought down the site, despite that you wanted to speed it up. Um, we should treat these type of actions the same way. Let's focus on impact and hopefully that can drive us to more equitable space. The other thing is protecting your team, right? So again, not going in with the, the full, you know, the optimism that nothing will be wrong and nothing bad will happen. It's better to assume that your environment will be hostile and anti-black than to assume that your environment will be, you know, perfect and clean. Um, so what do you do if you are bringing Black people into an environment that is hostile? How do you prepare to defend these Black people, your reports, your colleagues, um, against unwarranted or unjustified attacks, or even if there's small, minute critiques that they get that others don't get, um, that build up over time and play into the experience within your organization? Uh, one of the things you can do is document, right? Even if you don't have a, a culture of documenting everything, right? Be certain to document their successes. Um, because they're likely to get downplayed at some point in the future. Be sure to explicitly state the contributions that they've made, because unlike other people in your team and other experiences, it may not be assumed going forward. And lastly, I think you have to be prepared to sacrifice social capital in the spirit of getting honest evaluations, right? When you're pushing back on someone who's leveling a critique, but it may not be merited, there will be tension, right? Uh, this person may be higher, maybe on the same rank as you, like you saying that you're applying a different standard to this person than applying to someone else. Uh, there will be pushback, there'll be resentment. And, you know, are you, are you willing to do that for your team members? Are you willing to do that so that people are treated equitably? Um, I think that is something that needs to be understood and addressed uh, specifically within our community. Then we can also move on to recruitment. Um, there's always the discussion on the pipeline problem. Uh, I really beg the question, is it the pipeline or your pipeline? I think people underestimate how many black people actually exist in this space. And just because they're not in your organization or in the organizations that are closely tied to your social network does not mean they don't do this work. Uh, we are here, we have been here. Um, you haven't allowed us into your spaces, right? Um, and that is, that is something that needs to be acknowledged and then addressed, right? So other things that we can talk about is like, what percentage of your pipeline is driven by referrals? If we know that our social networks are extremely stratified, if we have a significant number of our hires coming in through referrals, that becomes an engine amplifying inequality, right? Um, in what communities are you an active member? I think this is extremely important. I think some people they want, you know, they want a diverse team, they want to recruit a diverse team, but they tend to view uh, recruitment, they don't always view recruitment as a one-time act, but especially in regards to diverse recruitment, they view it as a one-time act, right? Like, hey, I want to make sure that this job listing is out here and stuff like that. There's less focus on building relationships with that community, right? Um, and it's, it's what you do when you are trying to recruit the best talent possible, right? You give talks in spaces, you meet people, you listen to things, you develop relationships. Um, and with the hope that some way down, way down the line, it will pay off into possible recruitment opportunities. This type of effort and diligence is seldom given 
um, to diverse acts of recruiting um, and it's something that should be fixed. Uh, also in recruiting, uh, what do your interviews tell you, right? Um, I'll perhaps get more into this when we talk about the PhD admissions process, but we don't know what, what will make someone good at a job, right? The best way to know is to have them work on the job. Um, but we do, we have this tradition of certain types of interviews, styles, and things like that. And despite, you know, data showing that this isn't correlated to performance in the job, uh, we stick through it um, because it's, you know, it's how you got here. It's how it worked in the past. People are, you know, traditionalists um, by nature so for whatever reasons. Um, and, you know, often it does not pick who's best suited for the job, but who knows the interview protocol. Um, there's also other things like a lot of times there's a focus on finding holes as opposed to identifying strengths when going through the interview process. A lot of the interview process is designed around the ego of the interviewer. Um, and you want to feel good and smart, like, and you deserve to be here through doing it. Um, and it's less about identifying the best people for the job. And we need to be honest about that and start fixing it. Um, other things are who knows you, who do you know, right? Like who knows you well enough where they could recommend a quality friend and know that they'll get a good shot, right? Like if you, if you don't have these relationships with black people, you know, you're not gonna be able to build an org, which um, is more diverse and inclusive. Uh, what campuses do you visit? Uh, do you know professors, administrators, students on a first name basis, right? You may know all of that as your alma mater and maybe a few other, you know, prestigious schools, but perhaps you don't know that in, you know, schools in which there's larger black populations and these are things that need to be specifically addressed. Um, does your employee base reflect that of the field? Do you actually know what the, what the demographics of the field actually look like? Does it reflect your location? Um, other questions are like, who is the highest ranked black person in your organization? This can maybe be used as a sanity check as well as, you know, people know that they could succeed there as well as help you better understand perhaps how toxic your organization actually is. A follow-up question on that would be, was the highest ranked person in your organization, did they come up through your organization or did they join after attaining their status, right? And I feel like that is also often a harsh, harsh pill to swallow, right? Often our environments are not conductive to people growing and succeeding. And even if we do have high level successful black people there, they achieved a lot of this status somewhere else and you know, you're just able to bring them in. Um, lastly, the, I guess, lastly on industry, maybe my favorite one, diverse teams perform better is an extremely common refrain uh, within the diversity and inclusion world. And my challenge to that is so what, right? Diverse teams perform better. That's besides the point. Uh, the, the point should be for pushing for a more equitable space. Um, and this just seems predatory in nature would be the way that I would say it, right? If the reason that we're championing diversity and equity and inclusion is because it can make us more money, like what happens when that stops being the case? Uh, do we stop? Do we go, like, is it, if uh, a team that includes black people is only as good as an all white team, do we no longer care about this? Um, this is something that we should really uh, investigate because I guess one of the things, one of the reasons why I feel strongly about this is because my question is diverse teams perform better. There's a lot of thought that like diverse teams perform better because of diversity of thought and different lived experiences. And perhaps that is the case. Perhaps it's also the case that diverse teams perform better because black talent is severely under leveled, right? You, you have people at software engineer who should be senior or staff. Um, you have people that's, you know, manager who should be director um, and things like that. And so when you have these diverse teams, they're more talented because they've been undervalued by your organization. And so of course these teams perform better. These people should be in higher roles. Um, and if we fix that inequality, then, you know, from my perspective, I expect a lot of these diverse teams performing better to go away. Um, as well as sometimes this thing is used to undermine some diversity efforts, like, you know, that we're pushing for, we need diversity of thought. Again, that might or might not be the case, um, but I, I think there's sufficient evidence that diverse and black talent is under leveled within organizations all across our industry. Um, 
And I think we should focus on addressing things like that. Okay, so switching uh, topics really quickly um, into academia. So academia is the most central institution in our community. Uh, it is where talent is developed. It helps set the research directions of our community. Um, and any anti-Blackness present in academia will quickly permeate and reinforce as elsewhere in our community. As such, I think it deserves a lot of in introspection um, and efforts to fix it there. So, you know, start by addressing faculty. The one I'm starting with is who, who is admitted. I'm starting here because it is a place where faculty have a tremendous amount of autonomy. And it is also an area which is deeply flawed, has a lot of flaws, areas that can be fixed. So I wanna start with the goal of an admissions process. It should be, I'll say, is to assess research potential. To be honest, blunt, transparent, uh, we do not know how to do this. We may convince ourselves that we know how to do this, but I, I have yet to see any form of uh, randomized control trial, uh, which shows that you know we know how to assess research potential. Um, so instead of you know having something that's perfect or whatever, uh, we have these traditions which we follow, um, in which we typically look at things like GPA, letters of recommendation, research publications, GRE scores, and statements of purpose, and you know we believe that by uh, pouring over them, we can come up with some really good proxy um, for research potential and move forward. My issue is that a large number of these measures that we look at um, have significant bias, right? So let's, let's start with research publications and letters of recommendation. Um, these are often the direct products of our physical resources and our social networks. Uh, we are well aware, I hope that we are all well aware of the observed bias in writing of letters of recommendation, right? Whether we're calling someone resilient or calling them brilliant often depends upon, you know, the ethnic or the gender background of the person we're writing about. Um, there's also the aspect of whom the letters come from really matters, right? If it's from someone you know and trust inside your network, um, it may be treated with more weight um, and you feel like you may be better to assess the qualifications of this person. But the thing is that we already know our networks are extremely socially stratified. Um, so how does that play in? How does that continue to amplify bias here? Um, other things are, you know, access to computational resources, research labs and potential mentors varies greatly along racial lines, right? Um, and that has an impact on like what you will observe as, hey, the publication count or whatever, right? Um, that is not necessarily a statement of potential. Um, a lot of times that is more of a statement of what resources they had access to um, given things. Um, the other thing is even the research questions are informed by social groups. What you find interesting is mirrored back by what people in your network find interesting and what you're able to collaborate over and things like that. Um, the more stratified our networks are, the more these type of things contribute uh, to continuing anti-Blackness uh, in our community. Other question is who is mentored? So in this sense, I'm using a loose sense of mentor. Um, I'm including PhD students in here, but like look at everything else outside of PhD students, which may fall under people who get mentored, undergraduate students, visiting researchers, master students, postdocs, uh, external collaborators. Um, what are the selection processes for these? Are they clear and transparent? And do they account for the three sources of bias, right? Or are they informal and primarily happen through social networks? Um, and so perhaps are even more skewed and biased uh, than the traditional admissions process, even though you know, it's an area where there's way less risk for making the wrong one, right? Um, it's not a five, six year commitment as a, in a PhD student, uh, but because it only comes through social networks, you don't even have, really have the opportunity to get more diverse people. Other questions are, are they compensated, right? Uh, people who, can afford to do research uncompensated, often have some form of a financial cushion backbone and things like that. 
if you have a large if you have a large portion of your visiting researchers who are participating in research in an uncompensated manner, uh, this also will you know exclude certain populations from being able to participate here um, as letters of recommendation or a form of currency within our field, uh, this can easily become a mechanism of further perpetuating uh, anti-Blackness within our community. Who are your collaborators? Um, this is, you know, continuing to dig a little deeper, um, but how insular is your group of external collaborators? Um, are they primarily former students and postdocs of your group, maybe with some combination of former uh, students and postdocs of your academic advisor? Um, do they extend well outside of uh, an insular and historically homogenous social network? Um, are any of your external collaborators from minor minority serving institutions or places with greater ethnic diversity? This is one of the things that we should definitely interrogate as we talk about who gets access to you know, research, to doing quality research, doing research related to your work, which you know, may merit uh, acceptance, broader acceptance into this community. Other questions are, what are your feeder labs in schools? Um, so 10 CS programs in the US make up 50% of all CS faculty within the US. Or, you know, graduate school admissions tend to follow some, somewhat of similar patterns, things like that. Uh, are these feeder schools, uh, do these feeder schools have diverse populations? Are you pulling 50% of your uh, potential faculty or your potential graduate uh, department from places which are overwhelmingly homogenous? Uh, the other thing which I'd ask is like, what is your relationship with historically black colleges and universities? So I say this because HBCUs have one tenth the student population of all of the R1, research one institutions uh, combined. However, they produce more black computer science graduates. Um, so how do you Im imagine that this affects your recruitment pipelines? Do you know the professors at these HBCUs? Or you know, will you understand what they're saying in these letters of recommendation? Are they included in your trusted social network? Uh, are you set up to evaluate students not at R1 institutions, right? Where perhaps they have less exposure um, to kind of continuous uh, research opportunities than those at R1 institutions. Um, are you familiar with their programs? Uh, ability to evaluate course selection, GPA, like all these type of things. Um, so I'm here, I'm listing out some of the HBCUs which produced the greatest number of CS graduate students, CS students, um, and I hope that some people may take the, you know, the opportunity to get more familiar with these programs, right? So North Carolina State, Southern University, Norfolk State, Johnson C. Smith University, Florida A&M, Alabama A&M, uh, South Carolina State University, Lane College, Russ College, University of Arkansas Pine Bluff, Virginia State University, and Morehouse College. So transitioning a little bit uh, to perhaps an, an equally, if not more important topic, who is hired as faculty? Similarly to us not having an objective way to measure talent for a job, an objective way for measuring uh, research potential for a PhD, is there an objective and accurate way to measure faculty potential? Um, and I'll answer that no, there isn't. Um, and other questions are, how are they treated once they're here, right? Historically, what has been, how have you retained black faculty, right? Are they, you know, you could, you could look at some, some areas which tend to happen in all these different situations are things like collaborations, right? Are they getting the same amount of collaborations within the department as other, you know, new faculty to your program are? Um, other questions are like, what are the feeder schools, right? If you're still sampling from this, you know, these 10 CS universities that produce so much of the faculty, how does this affect your, fac your faculty hiring process? Um, are you just recreating and amplifying all of the issues that exist in your PhD admissions pipeline? Uh, I really wanna push faculty to interrogate this and think about this deeply. Uh, I know that there's gonna be this, you know, a gut reaction that it works for me, right? 
it works for me. It got me here. I'm great. Um, and so this process is good, right? You know, you saying that the process is flawed on, on its on a fundamental level will, you know, great and irritate me um, and make me less likely to dig into these questions. Um, please spend that time and effort and look into it um, because black faculty have a strong impact on how black students within your programs succeed and feel affirmed and things like that. And so, you know, oftentimes, yeah, work on all of them at once, but this one is very important. Uh, how much do you pay? This is another core component of that contributes to anti-blackness within our community. Systems that require financial sacrifice for professional advancement are extremely effective at removing black talent from leadership pipelines. This is like a description of grad school, right? Um, we, you know, I guess we celebrate this uh, financial sacrifice that we expect grad students to pay in order to be a member of academia and things like that. Um, this is a choice. This is something that can change, this is something that faculty can push to change right, uh, faculty in conjunction with graduate students, however we want to say it, this is something that can definitely change. Uh, it is extremely important because it, there, there are a lot of talented Black CS people who are interested in research, which, you know, the, the depth of the discrepancy in pay between graduate school and going into industry makes this untenable, right? Like, the, you know, maybe Google Black tax and things like that. A lot of us have external financial, you know, financial factors, which, you know, we can't just go six years and only think about ourselves. Um, and as such, it, it makes, you know, these type of programs untenable to a lot of talented and qualified people who are like there and ready to succeed. Um, so this is a choice. This is a choice that hurts Black people that faculty benefit from, right? Paying smaller amounts means that you can have more people, there can be more research done on the same grant uh, grant budgets, um, you know, contribute to more publications, H index, blah, blah. Um, but the, this, is, this is something that hurts black people in our community and we should, you know, actively address it. Uh, other things are what topics are celebrated and encouraged, right? I'm in the computer vision field. We have a tremendous history of enabling surveillance technologies um, and surveillance technologies have a well-documented history of being anti-Black. Um, there is recent growth in interest in ethical AI and it being more embraced by our community. However, even, the, even now with facial recognition getting, you know, uh, formal statements opposed from the ACM and things like that. Facial recognition work put out in the same time frame as the most popular ethical AI papers um, still far dominates it in terms of citations and things. Um, and I am gonna take the time to share a personal story here because perhaps arguing it from pure stats isn't the best uh, moment. Um, so for me personally, uh, I guess it was eight years ago um, when I got my first you know, job internship in the AI space. Uh, I worked with a tremendous team at a small startup and I don't mean this as a knock on them in any way, um, but my first two days on the job uh, were spent demoing and practicing in front of the software that they were developing because they were aware that they didn't have dark skin tone people on their team and they suspected that their technology might not work as well uh, on a black person. And I guess they were, you know, ahead of the time and proactive to try to make sure that they captured as much data as they can uh, from black people to make sure that their products worked, worked there. Um, but there, you know, you can go back and, you know, look at when uh, studies looking at discrepancies in skin tone and race uh, started to enter the computer vision paradigm, right? Um, I believe the first publication at a major conference might have been might be 2019 or something like that, uh, which in, which examines this. So it was a known secret, but not viewed as worthy of research. Um, and that's just kind of like the type of things like setting topics and agendas, uh, which contribute to a long time period of anti-blackness within the show. Uh, 
Uh, lastly, I guess I want to talk about what climate exists in your lab and university. This is a similar set of questions I was asked for industry. What happens when things go wrong? Who are you protecting? Who are you prioritizing? Um, who collaborates with who, right? Uh, one of the, the struggles for Black graduate students uh, across the globe, I guess, uh, is, you know, not getting as much collaborators. People are less interested, right? Whatever internal biases are there. And, you know, collaborations make and break researchers. Uh, we don't do this alone. Um, and, you know, are you aware? Are you noticing? Are you keeping an eye on that? Are you encouraging these, you know, specific collaborations and things like that to ensure that the people within your program have a, a beneficial experience? Um, other questions are like, what are the expectations on hours worked, right? Like, uh, there's, you know, a long standing assumption of like, this is all you do and all you, all you can do. Uh, that's a very privileged take that not everyone is allowed to, to take, right? Like, even if I'm just doing things to help other graduate students, uh, that might be less time I spend in the lab than others. And if your lab culture, you know, prioritizes living there, um, that can have negative impacts for grad black graduate students. Um, so I want to recap uh, some of the things like one, secure your own mask first, start with places where you have power. Um, next, you know, if you, you're trying to combat this, let's focus on empowering those around you who are already working on these things. Um, and perhaps lastly is like, you know, effort over ingenuity, like there, you know, the solutions to these things, you know, aren't necessarily mysteries. Uh, it just requires the will um, and people, you know, being willing and putting in the effort to pushing for these changes.